terms like slow life, detox and mindfulness, the demand for organic food and contact with nature, the rise of minimalism. All of these things have become dominant topics in our conversations. And what they all seem to suggest is that there is a need to break with a vicious cycle of stress, a stress that is full of people rushing around, burying themselves deeper and deeper in an excess of technology and products. But is it possible to live on the edge of this daily hurricane of stuff? Is it possible to maintain a healthy relationship with our things? And more importantly, are we preparing our children to be happy and free adults as we immerse them in a society where image is king and wild consumerism seems to control us? We wanted to talk with some families about how they approach raising their children on these issues. Hello. This is Maria del Rincón. We would like to interview people from all around the world with different backgrounds, with different situations. We found out about seven couples from five different countries who were all attending a conference on family and parenting in London. We agreed to meet there. But before we met in person, we started our conversations with each family virtually. We asked the parents about how they had been raised, specifically with regards to money and material possessions. We intuited that in this area of life, as well as in many others, we owe a lot to our parents. And at the same time, we project many of our own desires, insecurities and struggles onto the upbringing that we give our children. Mi papá salía de la casa con una chaqueta y volvía sin esa chaqueta porque se la había regalado a alguna persona que la necesitaba. Era alcalde de un lugar eh, rural donde dio toda su vida por esa gente. Sabía que pertenecíamos a un grupo más privilegiado, que en realidad no nos faltaban las cosas importantes, pero le hacían en la realidad de gente más pobre. Y, y eso... Eh, Bueno, fue un, un gran regalo porque a, nos enseñaron a quererlos a todos por igual, que, que bueno, había que dar muchas gracias a Dios por las cosas buenas que teníamos, pero que también estamos, teníamos que estar dispuestas a compartir con los demás. Lo que sí tengo recuerdo es que no, a mi familia eh, nos tocó vivir años muy difíciles de, de, en Chile, en, en la época del año 70, 73. Me tocó varias veces que nos mandaban eh, a mí, que yo tenía en ese tiempo, no sé, Cinco años, nos mandaban a hacer una cola para comprar pan, para comprar un pollo. Entonces, uno tiene ese recuerdo muy marcado de, de como quien dice, de apreciar las cosas eh, que uno tiene ahora. ¿ya? Pero nunca una cosa que uno se amargara porque no, sé, no tenía un viaje, no tenía un, un auto más grande o alguna marca, sino que era no, una vida normal. The biggest punishment uh, I, I could receive was disappointing my parents. I could honestly say that. So, um, I, my, my parents, um, what they thought of me and gaining my parents' respect and love was very, very important to me. And I got in trouble at school one day and, um, and my dad got called in and he had to, uh, and we had a, had a sort of a meeting with the principal, the three of us. And I was, the, the, the worst part about that day was seeing my father's expression or the look on his face. That, that was the biggest punishment for me. My parents were immigrants. They grew up in Sri Lanka. They both ended up leaving and ended up in Africa, which is where they met and where I was born. Um, in Africa, we lived really well because we had I know, it's quite a good life, but then moving to Australia I was probably quite tough on them because we weren't, we stayed with family friends when we first arrived, but dad always says that we got richer with each kid that came along. When I was younger, I used to try to control every single situation or everything around me. I used to try to want to influence or impact everything and still it's my natural tendency. So maybe that's another insecurity, letting go uh, can be difficult and um, being vulnerable to not having control of the situation. But uh, I'm trying to work on it. 
I love clothes, I love fashion, I love dressing. So I definitely have my moments of, oh, I wish I could have that brand thing or, um, you know, that friend of mine holds a new dress every time I see her. I have moments like that, but I, the way we were brought up was not to, that's not the end of the world. At the end of your life, um, there was this seven months that this uh, parish priest gave, and he said, I've done a lot of funerals, and no one's ever stood up there and gone, you know, she had the latest Prada bag, and she had these earrings, and she had that. They talk about the type of person they were. So I always think, like, well, at the end of the day, I hope that, you know, people loved me, and not what I wore, so. de compararme con mis amigas que tenían más cosas o viajaban más. A, a mí me gustaba, pues me gustaba lo que tenía y era feliz con lo que tenía. Entonces se me, me ayudaron a yo este, ganar mi propia dinero, por ejemplo, y a que se pueda ahorrar. En alguna ocasión fuimos un grupo muy grande de sus amigos a un basurero de Guadalajara donde vivían, donde vive gente literal, los escombros, alimentan de la basura, no participan. Este, como que siempre trataban de, que, de inculcarnos la, esta conciencia social. Nos dijo que ya no iba más la empresa. Eh, en México vino una crisis fuertísima en el 1994, eh, en donde las personas que tenían créditos, muchos empresarios tenían créditos, por las tasas de interés que se subieron muchísimo, esos, esos, ese dinero que se debía, esos créditos, que se, se fueron al cielo. Eh, si eras una persona consciente y querías hacer las cosas bien, como el caso de mi padre, y querías pagar, eh, era literal empeñar todo lo que hubiera. Y mi padre empeñó la empresa para pagar hasta el último centavo que debía, empezando por sus empleados. Entonces luego que llegó y pues ya no hay más empresa y tenemos que hacer frente a esto juntos. Y mi padre empezó a buscar trabajo como loco, como pudiera, estuvo en los riegos, estuvo vendiendo seguros, se metió al club social donde estábamos, que eso importa mucho en, en Guadalajara, y ser socio y accionista, ah, pues ahora dijo, yo, yo ahora quiero ser empleado, y el valor del trabajo, eh, con, este, con este episodio de la empresa que, que tronó, eh, me ha marcado para mi vida, eh, te, me enseñó a ser humilde, me enseñó a, a entender el valor del trabajo, y que también el valor del dinero es relativo, y que la felicidad no depende del dinero, que sí, que sí que te ayuda, ¿eh? Las penas con pan son menos, pero, pero, pero no es la felicidad. Vengo de eh, una familia de ocho hermanos en, una, en un pueblo. Lo material estaba siempre un poco limitado. O sea, tener, tener de todo, de todo, pues no. Eh, las, las zapatillas en vez de las Nike, las Nikito o de, son tonterías de esas. Eh, las bicicletas, pues hombre, yo como era la segunda, pues siempre tenía más o menos o la nueva o la segunda. <ríe> Llegaba abajo, tenía la octava. Pero recuerdo mucho cariño, muchas relaciones, eh, sí, mis hermanos. Mi padre era un general practitioner, un GP, un uh, doctor que um, su trabajo work involved Um, driving around Guernsey, this little island, um, visiting people, so he knew a lot of the people, you know, on the island. The next stage of my childhood involved lots of boarding school. I was rather aware that the school that I went to was quite a posh school. Um, I don't think I had this issue at home so much. I didn't feel like I grew up in a posh family particularly. The pe people who've been to Eton have this problem. Eton is a really a famous school and some people absolutely love it because they receive a wonderful education there. Other people, I think, find that a bit of a burden to live with later in life. And I think on a sort of small scale, the school I went to, although it's not nearly as famous as that, um, it was still a pretty privileged place to be. I had lots of lovely friends and, 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 and I certainly enjoyed my time there. Um, but when I came to the end of my school, I had to choose a university. Definitely felt that it was time for me to uh, to leave that world behind. I was born in the Philippines. We moved to Australia when I was three. My mom and my dad would always send money back to the Philippines. My my mom grew up from a poor 
family, but as a family growing up, I don't yet. We we were never in me. Um, and you know, luckily, my career, you know, it's progressing, and you know, I'm able to put away a bit more money each year, you know, save up for something else each year, and so it's it's been you know nice to to do that lately. Um, it was a bit hard when I was just doing my PhD um, and just really squeezing every last dollar, you know, dollar out of, um, the last bit of value out of every dollar we get, you know, trying to make sure we, we uh, do the things that we have to do and not anything more. <laughs> My childhood was in the war time, so we passed a, di a difficult time, and we passed a very nice time. But during war, it's not easy. We was very well raised. We have. Every, I don't want to say that we have everything because it's very hard to get uh, to get everything. But uh, we was happy. The main the main uh, issue we we was. Happy. I, I like shopping, but usually when you have a family and a kid. So it's not, it, you don't think only about yourself. I have a daughter, 12 years old, and if I want to go shopping, I have to think of her also, <laughs> to take her with me. It's not only about me. When I came to Santiago, I was married, it cost us a lot. We started very de zero, o sea, very de zero. Married, two babies, two little chicos, and we didn't have a car. Viajábamos en bus a Argentina, como todavía no estaba esto low cost eh, de los vuelos aéreos más fácil. Entonces uno puede decir que en esta última década esto también evolucionó rápido. Entonces uno eh, vino un poquito para atrás y, y nos tocó eso. Una vida igual eh, me cuesta arriba. ¿sí? Y me da envidia desde la bici que tiene otro y que uno dice, bueno, porque tengo cinco chicos no me puedo comprar una bici marca X, que me encantaría, o el tiempo libre, eh, que, por ejemplo, yo trato de trotar una vez a la semana, ¿sí? Eh, pero sí, es, entra en esas como envidias malsanas del tiempo libre de otro, o del estado físico de otro, puede sonar rastrero, pero así, eh, quizás de los puestos de otro, que digo, pucha, yo llevo acá 11 años y este que lleva menos, ya está en otro puesto, o dirige tal área, o este entró así. Bueno, no te puedo decir que no me gustan las marcas, los autos. Sí, obviamente. La ropa para, para andar, para trotar o para... Pero antes era como una debilidad más fuerte. Hoy día creo que no es una pasión dominante, por decirlo de alguna forma. Eh, eso, eh, quizá esta idea de volver a la vida sencilla, de campo, todo sea un poco para uno desligarse de todos estos lastres que uno tiene. Finally, we were on our way to London. At last, we would be meeting the couples in person. Although we had already spoken to them for hours, they had told us about how their parents had raised them and how they were trying to approach their own relationships with their possessions. And now we would tackle the exciting topic of raising children, which is what we had wanted to talk about in the first place. Some of these material things, and certainly me, I've been guilty of this in the past, um, is that it distracts you from the more important things, or it, it occupies your mind so much that you can't sort of do other things well. Um, one thing that I've been trying to work on since the kids have been born is talking less about things. Because that gives out less, less importance for them. Talk That's about things that are important, important. I guess. They, I guess, yeah, if, I'm, if daddy's constantly talking about those things, they might think that that is what's important mm -hmm. when it's not, so... Eh, para que mis hijas, para lograr que nuestras hijas tengan una relación sana con las cosas, intentamos no saturar sus deseos. Es decir, no darle las cosas antes siquiera que las deseen. Por ejemplo, ahora que está muy de moda ir a Disney, pues no, no llevarlos antes siquiera que, que lo deseen, ni siquiera, ni siquiera se les antoja ir porque no saben que existe ese lugar y, y no hay por qué llevarlos, sino esperar a que tengan la edad en la que lo puedan 
disfrutar, comprender, desear, esperar, ansiar y, y se lo ganen. Entonces con este tema de los viajes o con este tema de Disney, quizás soy yo el que quiero verla, disfrutar eh, y eso hace que, que pues sea, sea yo el que, el que esté provocando generarse una necesidad. Entonces eh, creo que me sirve que digas eso. Living in London, you, you mix up with such an extraordinary degree of different types of, ah, you know, situation. Very, very wealthy people who take helicopters and people who are very, you know, very deprived, lots of poverty, lots of, lots of homeless people in London. And you live, you know, shoulder by shoulder with everybody else around you. And it, 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 it isn't easy actually in London to get a sense of where you fit into it all. Los chicos a veces las cosas materiales quieren, quieren tener de todo o probar de todo. Entonces es como calmarles la ansiedad. Y claro, vos te das cuenta que en el minuto quisieran tener todo lo tecnológico y, y a veces aunque lo puedan pagar con sus propios ahorros, que son pocos, eh, uno le dice, bueno, espera, o sea, no, no hace falta o una salida afuera con, lo, con los amigos, no es necesario que salgas tres días seguidos, o sea, calma. El otro día un hijo nuestro se ganó un premio de excelencia académica y él o el hijo, bueno, ¿qué vamos a comprar? ¿Qué va? Espera, porque dentro de tres años o dos años puede ser que esa, esa, ese dinero te haga falta para tener un laptop o una, un computador para ir a la universidad. O sea, linkear claro. el tema de la utilidad y la espera. I guess essentially we you know, want them to be able to um, have opportunities like, like we had. And, um, but you know, I think mainly we're just thinking about you know, how can they be more resilient or how can they be more loving, you know, more generous. Um, you know, that's kind of a picture you know, I have in our heads and in my head. And, When we talk about, you know, how uh, what we're trying to aim towards, those, are those kind of virtues and those kind of sort of parts of their character that we want to develop, you know, that's what we're trying to get them towards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the foundation stone can be to know how to love the others and to be loved by the others. And this is, I think it's based on, um, as I said, virtues, confidence in themselves. Uh, and value that uh, we received from our parents and they are receiving even. We're transmitting it to the kids. Creo que le hemos tratado de transmitir que se anclen en el pasarlo bien, en gozar la vida, porque la vida es un regalo. Nos reímos mucho de nosotros mismos, de las tonteras, de las equivocaciones, de las tonteras, de los recuerdos eh, y, y, y de la sencillez. Yo creo que la sencillez es algo súper importante porque. Eh, cuando hemos salido de vacaciones, de repente no tenemos dónde almorzar y pasamos a un almacén y compramos un pan y un plátano y ese es el almuerzo. Entonces, eh, yo creo que la sencillez y la simplicidad, digamos, sí. de no ser tan rebuscado y en la, al final, ellos de lo que más se acuerdan es de las cosas eh, más simples o, o, o más sencillas. O... I think something we know is that if the, the more you give or think about other people, the happier you are. So bringing them up with that mentality, which is very hard to do in this world because it's all about me, me, me. Like yesterday we were listening to a talk on bringing up kind children and it got me thinking like are we doing that? That's obviously something that we want to do. Eh, que se quieran, que, que, que quieran a sus papás cuando sean grandes. Bueno, yo estaría quizás trotando todo el día o andando en bici y sé que quizás no tengo que estar todo el día con eso, tengo que estar la mitad y diciéndole bueno, pero ¿qué es lo que quieres hacer vos? Claro, uno le gustaría mejor descansar en la casa, pero si no salir de la casa están con pantallas o con celulares. Entonces es generosidad de los padres de, de tener que salir uno mismo y decir, bueno, eh, dejo de hacer algo que me gustaría o nos gustaría a nosotros en pos de, de los chicos. Creo que hay que ser generosos, eh, hay que ser humilde, reconocer cuando uno se equivoca, pedir perdón al otro, disculpas. Eh, hay que salir a la calle. Entonces nosotros intentamos eh, aunque nos cuesta igual hacerlo con más frecuencia, es ir a algún hogar de, de ancianos eh, y, y estar y compartir en familia y, y nos hace muy bien, nos hace muy bien también como, como familia eso. But yeah, I guess you know I, I didn't grow up with a lot of things and I, I felt like I don't need those things and I want the kids to have a very similar kind of set of values where they don't necessarily need to have everything that they want right now. We want them to be grateful for what they have so they don't feel like they have to have that. 
um, just you know because sometimes they can be really really focused on missing out on that thing but yeah. I guess it was sort of yeah. freeing them from the need to have that thing. Definitely they would like to have more but uh, we don't provide them more not because we don't have the money or the means to get them but this is a part of our education to have the self-control to work on what they want not everything we want in life we can get it so this is why we don't get them everything and we explain this and usually when we say no to get something we tell them you cannot get everything in life or if you want to get something you have to work hard to get it if a kid of 10, 12, 15 years old has everything. When he has 20, 25, uh, after uh, he finish, uh, after he will graduate, what he's aiming for? What's his perspective? What he want? If he has everything uh, before, what's the goal? Estamos tratando de prepararlos para la vida real. Es muy difícil hoy día porque en general no les enseñan eso, sino que lo están criando entre algodones, decimos nosotros, con, ah, de esponjita para que no sufran, para que no les pase nada, para que muy y después salen a la vida real y salen indefensos. Cuesta mucho porque, porque cuando tenemos que retar a un niño de nosotros, porque vemos que no ha sido fuerte, porque se dio, porque, porque bueno, porque hizo, se fue por el camino más fácil. Eh, a veces nuestro, los niños lloran de pena y a uno como mamá le duele, al papá le duele que los hijos lloren porque de repente ellos como niños no nos entienden el trasfondo que hay detrás. Eh, por eso uno por un lado quiere formarlos para la vida siendo niños fuertes, pero a veces uno cede un poco, o sea uno se equivoca a veces un poco porque... Sí, que, que uno tiene que ceder de repente porque si no pasa a ser ya un, casi un dictador. Sí. Es que de repente elegir las batallas donde no ceder Eso. y en las cuales ceder, claro. ¿ya? explicándolo a los hijos que hay cosas en la vida que en las cuales si uno se equivoca eh, la caída duele mucho ¿ya? y en otras no tanto, entonces uno ahí va eligiendo y puede decir mira en esto no vamos a ceder porque es por tu bien. You know, the, for the good of our kids, sometimes we have to say no, and they will suffer in life, and we can't control that. So, and it's good for them, and they will grow from it, and we can help guide them through it. It's difficult this world. They have to be strong. They have to be very strong. So, yeah, sort of, I'm sort of a little bit hard to them sometimes. But for me, it's always a struggle because you don't want to say no because it's such a bore, and you want to have a good time with your kids. Sometimes the kids want us to open a lid for them and you know lid sometimes lids can be really really hard and I don't want to be able to do everything for them so I just yes. so I'll just sort of undo it a tiny bit but still make it a little bit hard I say okay now guys you do it no poderles dar todo quitarles el sufrimiento aliviárselos un poco es que me parte el alma ver a mi hija como sufriendo por cualquier cosa y trato inmediatamente de aliviarlos mi primera reacción Eh, bueno, pues y si le doy esto y si le compro esto, pero luego eh, como que hago un poco de análisis y digo, no, espera, es que esta reacción primaria quizá no pueda ser lo mejor para, para mi hija. Eh, soy el primero que me cuesta a mí, de verdad es que se me hace bien difícil eh, y tengo que recurrir a cómo eran mis papás con mi hijo y cómo me ayudaron. I think it's so natural that you take on what you've been brought up with and then um, obviously we've had many discussions away about the way my parents have raised me as opposed to where his parents raised him. We recognize a lot of our parents' value and this is it's reflecting in our uh, the way we are living and uh, the way we are behaving together or even we are raising our children. I know in my early 20s before I met Tamara, it sort of, I had a very warped, not a very warped view, but uh, uh, a slightly warped view of an unhealthy relationship with things with things and thinking that that was important or that's what was going to bring me happiness um, it didn't make me happy tomorrow and these kids make me happy mm -hmm.